I'm Jay Bushinsky in Jerusalem. In the past year, 12,000 Ethiopian Jews arrived in this country. We are about to see how Operation Moses was carried out. It began in secret, and the scenes we are about to show have not yet been released to the mass media. Even before the creation of the State of Israel, Jews risked their lives to spirit their fellow Jews out of war-torn Europe, out of North Africa, from Iraq, and from behind the Iron Curtain. With the help of world jewelry, the little State of Israel has invested a major part of its resources in integrating the masses of new immigrants into its society. With all its experience of working with new immigrants, the Jewish Agency and the Government of Israel recognizes the absorption of the Ethiopian Jews as one of its greatest challenges. For this child taking his first breath of life on the plane bringing him to freedom, the path to integration is easy. The first language he will learn is Hebrew and the first culture is Israel's. For the rest of his family, the formidable task of learning to live in a strange land is before them. But on their arrival in Israel, these thoughts are put aside. After 2,000 years, a dream has come true. They have arrived in the promised land. With me are Uri Gordon, head of the Youth Aliyah Department of the Jewish Agency for Israel, and Chaim Aron, head of the agency's Immigration and Absorption Department. Mr. Aron, why were the Ethiopian Jews airlifted to Israel? You see, the um, Ethiopians started to come to, to Israel since 1977. But they were coming in little drops. When Prime Minister Begin decided to bring them, it was a very, very difficult task to do. When the opportunity was created that we could bring them in big numbers, we airlifted them. Mm -hmm. well, it was, was part uh, of, uh, of also of a salvation of a people. Yes, when you say salvation and uh, the emergency, are you referring to the famine that spread over East Africa and uh, the sub-Saharan region? I'm referring to the whole process and phenomena of Ethiopian Jews. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they were not living in the best conditions. We had to bring them here. We brought them here. But you have not actually uh, eliminated the entire uh, Jewish community of Ethiopia. As far as Ethiopia, there still are Jews in there Ethiopia. There still are Jews in Ethiopia. That's uh, part of uh, our problems that we feel uh, very, very strongly here in Israel. And um, we are hoping that uh, one day, as others came, those who are still there will come to. Well, uh, in bringing these people here, have you undertaken a, a, a phenomenal expense? I mean, the cost of training them and housing them and accommodating them and helping them adjust to life in Israel must be uh, a very heavy burden financially, not to mention uh, personnel-wise. No doubt it's a heavy burden. But you know, Israel has no priorities. Everything for us is priority, especially when we are speaking about the life of the, Jew of the Jewish people. So the question was not even asked. We knew we had to bring them. We knew we, have, uh, we had to absorb them. We still have absorb them and um, we made it possible with the help with the great help of the Jewish people. Uri Gordon, what would you uh, say is the motive that seems to be driving you and your colleagues in working for the successful integration of Ethiopian Jews in Israel? I must tell you that I myself was born in Israel but first of all before being an Israeli I'm a Jew and I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm proud that my country brought our brothers and sisters from Ethiopia to Israel. And this brings us a lot of motivation to deal with this immigration. In Youth Aliyah, we have now around 2,200 kids around 1,600 without parents. Ethiopian? I, I talk just about the Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. Without parents. And to deal with this, we are very happy that this is our task to do it. And I'm sure that the experience of Youth Aliyah during all the years that we deal with young people Yesterday, before the Ethiopian, the Iranian kids, today the Ethiopian, 
tomorrow we hope the Russia from the young people from Russia we have a lot of experience and I'm sure that after five years ten years these kids will be good citizen and uh, beautiful real flowers in my society Despite the fact that the Ethiopian Jews were cut off geographically from their biblical roots, they maintained a spiritual link to the Holy Land that dates back to the first temple of King Solomon. For over 2,000 years, the Ethiopian Jews have looked to Jerusalem as the source of their culture and history. Even in Ge'ez, the religious language of the Ethiopians, it is possible to detect the names of their Jewish forefathers. Among the Ethiopians, there is a common belief that they have a common historical origin with the Jews. They call themselves Beta Yisrael, the House of Israel. They believe that a local monarch, the Queen of Sheba, journeyed to the court of King Solomon. From the romance that blossomed between them, a son was born who took the Ark of the Covenant back with him to Ethiopia. Some of the Ethiopian Jews believe that they are descendants of the soldiers Solomon sent to protect his son on the journey. Once members of a proud, courageous monarchy, numbering in their hundreds of thousands, they have dwindled by the forces of man and nature to a mere fraction of what they were. They have been reduced to making tools and handicrafts, work despised by their neighbors who call them falashas, outsiders. In spite of the loss of many who have been converted to Christianity under duress, those who remain have kept faith with their religion. Mourning in the villages of Gondar and Tigre provinces is a common sight. The death may have been caused by famine, disease, or attacks by hostile neighbors. Life is unbearable in the villages, and when the state of Israel indicated its readiness to accept them, they left in their thousands. In a top-secret rescue mission, some were flown out of makeshift landing strips, but the majority fled on foot. The Jews swelled the hordes of refugees seeking relief from Ethiopia's famine. On the way, many were attacked and killed by bandits, insurgents, and Ethiopian soldiers. They arrived at the refugee camps in a pitiful state, but when Operation Moses got underway and through ingenuity and guile, the way to Israel was opened. The Ethiopian Jews became the target of jealousy of their fellow refugees. The Jews have a home and refuge, they said. We have nothing. The Jews waiting in the camps asked their rescuers about relations in Israel. Pictures and letters have been their only link with family members they have not seen for years. Perhaps soon they will be among the fortunate ones to fly by devious routes to Israel. From the plains, they are brought directly to absorption centers. Most find the reception delightful. But a few find it a little overwhelming. I welcome you on behalf of the government of Israel and the Jewish agency with the traditional blessing, Bruchim Habaim. We are all here to help you and invite you to approach us with any request or problem you might encounter. With the help of God and your help, we are here. Just as God took Israel out of Egypt, so did he take us out from bondage and into freedom. Shoshana Bendor, you're an ethnologist. Would you say that the Ethiopian Jews experienced culture shock on arrival in Israel? Well, I think we all experience culture shock on arrival in Israel. But I think we can define the types of culture shock of the Ethiopians in three areas. 
Uh, the first area, I think, is a tremendous emotional shock at discovering that individuals who were completely independent, um, capable individuals, able to make a living and to f uh, uh, provide for their families in many ways in Ethiopia, in very hard surroundings, have no skills which make it possible for them to be uh, independent individuals here, and they become completely dependent. Second? A second is the breakdown of the uh, social climate, the social structure that they knew in Ethiopia, which was very supportive, and here does not exist. Finally, and I think for many this is possibly the most important, is the religious breakdown. Ethiopians come from a traditional society, a very, very devout society, which is very hierarchical, and they arrive here and they are sort of caught in the middle. On the one hand, they want to be religious, and they're shocked by secular Israeli Jews. On the other hand, their Judaism is different in many ways from normative Talmudic Judaism, and they're made to feel very uncomfortable about this by those religious people with whom they wished, wished to identify. This was a crisis immigration. It required emergency treatment, medical as well as psychological and social. All of us have problems with bureaucracy, but imagine being dressed in strange clothes and being asked strange questions in a strange language. Having your fingerprints taken for identification purposes seems very odd. The sick are taken away for immediate treatment. Many are suffering from trachoma, malaria, and other diseases rarely seen in Israel today. Malnutrition is rife, but fortunately, with the correct diet, the condition will disappear. After health, the next priority is to reunite split families. The Jewish agency set up a special service to help in the search. When the uh, Olim from Ethiopia started to come in uh, large quantities, we were faced with a problem. They came in with part families. Uh, they were anxious to find out whether they, the rest of the family had arrived, whether they were here, where they were. And in the beginning, we tried to do it with uh, normal handwritten lists, and uh, our uh, uh, people were, were, were spending hours looking for single uh, uh, relatives or, or, or families. And we decided that we would try to solve the problem by using a computer. And we developed a program that would enable us, with whatever information the Ole was able to give us about their relatives, to find them find when they came and where they were sent to. Truly technology in the service of man. But after the ecstatic reunions and the questions about missing relations are ended, they begin to think of the future. But the future holds many problems, particularly for the young. Tamar Dotan specializes in counseling services for immigrant youth. Tamar, do you encounter psychological stress among the young immigrants from Ethiopia? Uh, yes, a lot of it is not uh, necessarily vis visible on first encounter, but uh, many of the young people have lost many of their family members. A lot of people have died on the way to Israel, and uh, there is a lot of grief. People have also been separated from the family members who remained in Ethiopia, and uh, they are not able to get their emotional support. They miss them. They worry a lot about them. But what effect does this have on them? Uh, the effect it has is that at the time when it's most necessary that they put a lot of energy into adjusting to a new society, they may not be able to do it because they're still in a period of grief over the people who have died they're not always able to concentrate in school. They have to cope with a lot of stresses together. Oradonio, as a person who uh, actually deals with the welfare services that are available to new immigrants, and in this case, immigrants from Ethiopia, what can be done to alleviate the problems caused by the transfer from one society to another? I think that, first of all, we have to help them uh, to get or to keep the uh, psychological uh, support of the families. Those children who are in youth alia institutions, uh, to let them to come and visit the families very often, 
Uh, so is for the youngsters in the age of 18 and 25 who are in a separate uh, institutions. This is first of all. Uh, secondly, I can say that uh, in the groups, in these, those institutions of uh, youngsters and youth, uh, to try to work together with them in group work, uh, to help them uh, to show feelings who are very deeply inside them and they are not showing it. What do you actually do, I mean, in the group therapy or the group uh, social work that uh, you practice? Uh, what do you try to get out of the children uh, that gives you a sign that you're being su successful? Uh, what uh, all the, uh, the therapists are trying to do is uh, to speak about emotions because we know that uh, in the refugees camps and later on the people were so frozen they didn't show any effect about things very important things that happen to them that usually we can see with effect on others but it's kept so deeply so to help them to speak about things, help them to understand and to work with and to be open to other things later on. For example, in one of these groups, I brought some clay to the group and the girls made uh, these dolls. This is a mother and a baby. And they, the girl was so happy about making them, so they, the girl who actually made these two dolls. That's in the Ethiopian costume, isn't it? Yeah. She took it home and she at home made all the clothes for the mother and for the baby mm -hmm. and very happily brought it back and presented it as, as a present for me. And it meant something? I think it meant a lot for mm -hmm. them. It meant a lot for them, yeah. For the Ethiopian Jews, Israel is a new world. In a way, they jumped from the early Middle Ages to the 20th century. This ultra-modern building complex is very different from the tekels, the native huts of the Ethiopians. Most of the new immigrants are housed in one of over 20 absorption centers, such as this one in Jerusalem. On their arrival, they are provided with some of the advantages of civilization, such as a dish rack and cutlery. Ethiopian Jews who have already been in Israel for several years work as advisors and translators to the new arrivals. At the end of the first day in Israel, the children are tucked into unfamiliar beds, wondering what the morning will bring. Culture shock. Skyscrapers, noise, and gleaming monsters replace the simple rural environment. Things that we take for granted seem to them to be a miracle. A door lock, a knife and fork, and the modern kitchen are unfamiliar to those coming from the more cut-off villages. They had their own way of preparing the simple dishes that made up their staple diet. It's hard for the Israelis to understand that the first demonstration of how a gas ring works can appear miraculous. And water was for drinking and washing, not for brushing teeth. But then, their teeth were not exposed to the dangers of a modern diet. In the village, she didn't have to work out how a clothes peg works. The multiplicity of choice is confusing for the average housewife, but how much more difficult is it for someone who can't read the labels, who doesn't know how to use the merchandise on sale? Should you wash with it, eat it, or wear it? The new immigrants also don't yet understand the value of money. They taste the questionable advantages of modern culture.
Many long for the familiarity of their own ancient culture. David Levine, what do you do to alleviate such problems in the immigrant absorption centers and other integration facilities of which you are in charge? Well, since this Aliyah is different than all the former Aliyah that we have known, we had to change our whole direction in staffing the absorption centers. Number one, first we have the Ulpan that we have with all types of Aliyot. We have different classes and different lectures which give them all the different things about Israel which they didn't know before, but that we have with other Olim also. Here we had to change, make a change as far as staff goes with house helpers. We have a big staff, a large staff of women who accompany these Olim from the beginning of their absorption till we f feel that they can be on their own feet. To be specific, I'm talking about different problems which we don't have with other Aliyot, such as how to go shopping, how to walk in the street, traffic, and things like that. In the initial stages, these people, these women, are with them day and night, I would say. Eventually, as we see there's progress. We have, they help them less. We also have different people in staff helping the children with homework and so on, which we didn't always have to have with other Aliyot. Uh, to sum it up, we just have a larger staff with a more of a personal, taking care of them in a more personal way than before until we feel that they're standing on their own two feet. The Ethiopian Jewish immigration included hundreds of children who arrived in Israel without their parents. They required special attention. It was given to them by the Jewish Agency's Youth Aliyah Department. One of Youth Aliyah's institutions, Hofim, was awarded the Knesset Prize as the institution which contributed most to the quality of life in Israel during the last year. It has dealt with hundreds of orphaned children. We hospitalized 92 children when they arrived here, suffering from malaria, from typhoid fever, from dysentery, from malnutrition, and from the wear and tear of a difficult journey to Israel. Emotionally, we've dealt with children who came here physically beaten, bruised, battered, raped. They had seen their families die on the way here. They have lost contact with their parents in many cases. And these children have required a tremendous amount of work by the psychologists and social workers who are on our staff. Educationally, We've dealt with children who came here completely illiterate and with children who had as many as eight, nine, or ten years of education behind them. And as a result, we've had to create an educational program here to enable all of them to find their way into the mainstream of education in the Youth Aliyah program in Israel. The problem, he says, is with the new language. But another problem for the students is mastering new learning habits. At Yamin Ord, the new students, in order to adapt, receive help on a one-to-one -one basis. Both here and in Hofim, the staff are impressed by the Ethiopians' will to learn. For example, when they first arrived, they, they were supposed to go to a period of sport outside, and uh, nobody showed up. And then it was realized that uh, they won't go to anything that's not in a classroom. So the director here brought the children uh, to the classroom with a sports teacher and gave the sports teacher a, a chalk, piece of chalk and said, put a basketball uh, on the blackboard and, and show how a ball jumps. And once they were in in introduced to sports through the classroom atmosphere, then uh, they were ready to uh, get to it right on the field and then they became expert sportsmen. <laughs> Here at Chofim, we try to teach the children everything they have to know about 20th century technological life. At the same time, we don't want them to forget their Ethiopian heritage. So we maintain an entire program to teach them the things that they would be doing if they had remained behind in Ethiopia. We encourage them to make all of the native musical instruments, to sew the native dresses, 
uh, to make the native utensils so that they will maintain a pride in the culture that they had when they were in Ethiopia. After generations of having to make a living by producing folk art and ironwork, the young Ethiopians can easily adapt their skills to modern uses. In Youth Aliyah's school in the village of Mikva Yisrael, they return to their agricultural heritage, although on a larger scale and using machinery of which they never dreamed. But with amazing speed, they adapt to the modern world. Very often, they can cope with computers after only two years of formal schooling. Receiving letters in Khofim is an occasion for mixed feelings. So often, the news from Ethiopia has been bad that the children are apprehensive to open their letters. Many still bear psychological scars of the abrupt cessation of Operation Moses. When the children heard that their parents would not be coming because immigration was stopped, they were despondent, they were angry, they refused to eat, they assembled together and said they would not go to classes. It was a form of striking. Uh, our administration gathered them together and said, what would you do in a similar situation if you had a crisis in Ethiopia? And they said that we would pray to God for help. Where would you go to pray? And they say, and there we pray in the high places. And then there was a suggestion, let's go to the Kotel in Jerusalem and pray to God. And that was indeed done. Immediately buses were ordered and they went to Jerusalem. They continued to fast that day until they uh, returned from Jerusalem. And then they were relieved that they had done what they could to express their hopes that their families would eventually come. The Ethiopian Jews are in Israel to stay they will become a permanent part of Israeli society. Like other Israelis, the new immigrants use demonstrations to voice their grievances. The Ethiopian immigrants objected to the fact that Israel's chief rabbinate was questioning their Jewishness. Their forefathers left Israel before the oral law was developed, and its law, therefore, was not a part of their religious practice. Because of this, and because the authenticity of their Jewish ancestry was in doubt, the rabbinate in Israel demanded their conversion by immersion. When a Jew comes to the Promised Land, I don't see in the Torah that says the Jews has to go to convert it in order to live in the Promised Land. The sit-down strike they held opposite the chief rabbinate in Jerusalem brought the intercession of government leaders. As far as it could, the rabbinate tried to accommodate itself to the feelings of the Ethiopians, but they demanded that Ethiopians who wish to marry must prove their Jewishness the same as any other immigrant. Has the religious issue been resolved to the satisfaction of all the parties concerned? For the answer to that question, I turn to the chief rabbi of Netanya, Rabbi Israel Lau. If uh, you ask me about the past, the answer is unfortunately not. If you ask me about the future, the answer will be, please God, yes. I want to explain that our outlook, the outlook, outlook of the chief rabbi of Israel is that the Ethiopian Jews are Jews. They are Jewish for at least 500 years that we know. But the problem was that they were cut off from all the Jewish resources, about 2,600 years. They have a Torah, but part of the Torah they unfortunately forgot, like Tfilin, like Mezuzah. And you have marriages and divorces and women who are married for second or third or fourth time and children from the first and from the third husband in order to solve all the problems and to go out from all the doubts, the best, best thing is reborn by this <coughs> ritual emerging. Women do it at least once upon a month. Men, many of us, great Rabbanim, they do it every day before the prayer. They symbolize cleaning up from all the past, from all the background they brought with them, and they start a new life in an old new homeland. What's wrong? 
הצלחנו במשך השנים האחרונות לקלוט ולהעלות קודם חלק ניכר מיהודי אתיופיה. In recent years, we have succeeded in bringing home a great deal of Ethiopian Jewry. There exists a clear-cut decision on the part of the government and the Jewish agency to resettle all of Ethiopia's Jews here in Israel. I wish we could do it all at once. But we are going to spare no effort until we can see every single Ethiopian Jew here with us at home. What does the future hold for Ethiopian Jews in Israel? If those who settled in Israel in previous years are an example, with patience, most of the problems of integration are easily overcome. Al Muyefet, learning to be a male nurse, has firm faith that the newly arrived young immigrants will have similar success. After three or four years, if you see these children, if you see these people that you'll, you'll admire. And this, I will see, the, uh, I see the future, a very nice future. The veteran immigrants have integrated into Israeli life and can be seen taking part in all spheres of activity and all occupations. They take an active role in integrating the new arrivals. They staff Israel Radio's Amhara language program. The process of absorption is slow and hard. When will we know it has ended? Well, I think we can say uh, they're absorbed whenever we see that the Ethiopian Jews when you can find Israel, Ethiopian Jews intermarrying with the other Jews who came all over the world, whenever we see Ethiopian Jews as uh, parliament members, as when you see Ethiopian Jews as army officers, then we can say that they are fully absorbed in the Israel society. The Israeli army is the melting pot of the state, and serving in it is almost a prerequisite for taking an active role in its society. Some of the young immigrants brought to Israel through Operation Moses have finished their pre-army training with honors, and the outstanding cadets receive awards. With pride, the Israelis who have adopted those lacking one or both parents celebrate the occasion. But what of those left behind? In the words of the Hatikva, we haven't lost hope, a hope 2,000 years old, to be a free people in our own land. The story of Israel is a story of integration. It is one of the modern world's most successful examples of the molding of a new nation from the disparate and seemingly incompatible remnants of its ancient past. Immigrants from all over the globe, from every Jewish diaspora, have been recast as Israelis. And it will be the same with the Ethiopian Jews, if only because they will it, and so do the rest of the people of Israel.